Well, hello, friends, and welcome to today's webinar, Jesus Christ is Raging, Congregational Song and the Legacy of Colonialism. We have participants today, uh, not only from North America, but of course our presenters from uh, the United Kingdom. And uh, I know we have at least one participant from Japan with us this morning, this afternoon, it's the afternoon here in Washington, DC. So we're really glad to get, be gathering people from East and West. It's a really, really great thing. My name is Mike McMahon. I'm the Executive Director of the Hymn Society in the United States and Canada, and I'm very happy to be introducing our presenter today, uh, the Reverend Dr. Janet Wooten, who is the Executive President of the Hymn Society of Great Britain and Ireland. Uh, Janet is a retired congregational minister, and uh, she served, served uh, in local congregations before she became Director of Studies for the Congregational Federation. Uh, she's written uh, quite some substantially, and uh, she's also in retirement now active in working on racism projects and exploring dissenting Christianity, focusing on hymnody and it's a significant cultural shape, I'm sorry, hymnody as a significant cultural shaper and reflector. So uh, if you um, want to uh, speak with each other through the chat, that would be great. Um, and if you would like to um, Put a question in the Q and A function that would help us. Uh, Brian Hain will be back at the end of uh, Janet's presentation to, uh, to to give the uh, questions to Janet and uh, have a further discussion. So, without any further ado, Janet. Thank you very much, and it's great to be here. Lovely to be uh, part of this. Um, the title of this webinar is taken from the hymn text. Um, the song that you just heard played just before we began um, by John Bell and Graham Maul of the Iona community. It's set to the tune Noel Nouvelle, as you heard, and begins, Jesus Christ is waiting, waiting in the streets. In this first verse, Jesus is alone, friendless, and the second half of the verse uh, sets the pattern for the whole hymn. I'm expecting to see the first slide up um, on the screen at the moment, just the first half. That's brilliant. Yes, fantastic. It works. Um, listen, Lord Jesus, it says, I am lonely too. Make me, friend or stranger, fit to wait on you. In later verses, we see Jesus acting, and the verses explore what it is that makes the singer fit to wait on him. Jesus heals, dances even, and finally calls so that the singer responds, Listen, Lord Jesus, let my fears be few. Walk one step before me, I will follow you. For the most part then, the hymn is typically of Iona texts, quirky, challenging, a bit startling. But the second verse from which our title comes has a real power to it. Jesus Christ is raging, raging in the streets, where injustice spirals and real hope retreats. Listen, Lord Jesus, I am angry too. In the kingdom's causes, let me rage with you. If I'm leading this in a congregation, I try to encourage a bit of dynamic in the verses. The healing verse can be bright, hopeful. The dancing verse, light and rhythmic. But the raging verse should be heavy and powerful, especially the response, listen, Lord Jesus, I am angry too. Let me rage with you, let me. The topic for the webinar came out of conversations in preparation for the panel on decolonizing hymns at the 2022 conference on which I was privileged to serve. I found myself as very often arguing for the powerful energy of holy rage. 
This is something I've been familiar with as a writer of and about feminist hymnody for 40 or more years. We learned the truth early of Law Order Lord's conviction that the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. Rage has been useful in loosening the hold that traditional hymnody has over us and providing the momentum to overcome some of the hostility and inertia of institutional patriarchy. Similarly, what Western or Northern Christians visited on the world in the 18th and 19th centuries, the era of expansion and colonial exploitation, the industrial enslavement of millions, and especially the unholy alliance between civilization, colonialism, and Christian mission, and in this context especially, the harnessing of hymnody, very specifically to control and pacify, makes me rage. Rage is not a cast of mind that we normally associate with the practice of Christianity, and for heaven's sake, that is part of the problem. I passionately believe with John Bell and Graham Maul and a whole tradition of Christian worship that bright, pure rage is both a rational and a divine response to the world in which we live. How could you look back on the colonial past and round at the racist patriarchal present and not rage? And why is this not in our singing? Because pacification and infantilization by the empire of patriarchy was such a powerful tool of colonialization, the release of sustained adult rage is part of the enterprise of decolonialization as well. It's there in scripture, of course. In fact, there's a very specific rage against vacuous worship that does not address inequalities and injustices in Amos chapter five. I hate your festivals. I don't like the sound of your noisy songs. Instead, let justice roll down. Jeremiah chapter seven. Don't say to me, here's the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, we've always done it this way. Instead, loose the chains of injustice. Isaiah chapter 58. Is not this the fast that I choose? It's justice and righteousness. And Jesus is right in this prophetic tradition when he rages against the use of religious worship to exacerbate injustice. It's not just the driving out of the money changers in the temple, though that is a huge burst of rage, but also his brilliant sustained attack on the religious professionals in Matthew 23, paralleled in Luke 11 and echoed in his many interactions with this group and the quick satire of some of the parables, such as the Good Samaritan. Where then is this tide of rage against the tyrants and exploiters of humankind in the language of our worship? Even Mary's song of God's revolution has been sanitized and its sting drawn. Otherwise, how could those traditions that sing the Magnificat Sunday by Sunday go out from their worship secure in the untroubled imagination of their hearts to put down those of low degree and send the hungry empty away again? I would argue that in this, hymnody has functioned as a tool of the religious establishment. It is born of the great creeds which themselves contain none of the dissenting voice of the prophets and move straight from the birth to the passion of Jesus, which have a, screed, uh, a slide with the creeds. Oh, there we are, lovely. Look at that and, what's missing there? They neatly sidestep any inconvenient teaching of the living, loving, healing, raging Christ, staying in the bright calm of heaven or the stiff dogma of the church. The creeds were formulated precisely to smooth away dissent in order to create an artificial unity to serve the tarnished Pax Romana in its declining years and thus prolong the grip of the classical empires on which colonial Britain modelled itself. Where there is anger in classical hymnody, it's turned back on the singer. I grew up singing hymns like this. Let holy charity mine outward vesture be, and lowliness become mine inner clothing. True lowliness of heart, which takes the humbler part, and o'er its own shortcomings weeps with loathing. Or Isaac Watts' heavy, sweet lines, 
when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory dies, or even more romantically in the original, where the young Prince of Glory died. My richest gain I count but loss, and poor contempt on all my pride. And the longing of William Cooper in the age of evangelical revival. Return, O holy dove, return, sweet messenger of rest. I hate the sins that made thee mourn and drove thee from my breast. The dearest idol I have known, whate'er that idol be, help me to tear it from thy throne and worship only thee. I loved these hymns as a child. I sang the lines about hatred and self-loathing with great passion. They shaped my childhood faith. What they do is to focus God's wrath back on the singer, reinforcing a sense of guilt and placing the full burden of responsibility for the relationship with God on the person seeking it. If you feel far from God, the adage goes, guess who's moved. They create a closed circle between the worshipper and God, itself enclosed within a wider suffocating circle of the church as the only conduit for salvation. The singer can only break out of that cycle of guilt and wrath into the controlling embrace of the church's teaching. There is no way of punching through that to an adult world where God encounters the forces of suffering and injustice head on and the power of prophetic wrath, should I say wrath, is unleashed. Of course, it's in the interest of the church and the establishment to keep the majority of people in that closed bubble. To this extent, religion and its controlling mechanisms function very well as the opiate of the masses, keeping us in drugged contentment, unable to wake, to exercise judgment, adult judgment, or to act. In the 18th and 19th centuries, religion, and particularly popular hymnody, served to pacify and to infantilize. First, ordinary worshippers, particularly children, then, by extension, colonized people through the mission field, and working people through evangelistic campaigns. The French historian Elie Halevi holds that Methodism saved the British Empire from the French experience of revolution. And Stephen Orchard roots this more particularly in the specific form of evangelism, the Sunday schools movement, whose declared objective was to combat the idleness of youth and protect private property. That Jacobinism should not find a foothold among the laboring classes and the poor. The Jesus of hymnody was gentle, overpoweringly sweet, repressively moralistic, and deeply conservative. Ian Bradley, writing in Abide With Me about Victorian hymns, says rightly that many Victorian hymns breathe an air of social conservatism. They are gentle rather than angry, reflecting the calm and secluded atmosphere of the country rectory rather than the chaos and squalor of the city slum or factory. There were hymns that addressed the sharp inequalities of 19th century Europe or the horrors of colonialism and enslavement and whose language was equal to their task. But as we shall see, these tended to appear in peripheral publications and soon disappeared. Christian socialist Percy Diemer included in Songs of Praise, the 1931 edition, hymns such as Turn Back, O Man, Forswear Thy Foolish Ways, set to the gorgeous five-line tune, Old 124th, from the Geneva Psalter of 1551, and also found in Henry Ainsworth's Book of Psalms, Englished, both in prose and in metre. The words rise with the tune, rising up to, to, to the dramatic fourth line particularly powerfully in the middle verse, but powerfully all the way through. And we're going to hear now a clip from Turn Back, O Man. Earth might be fair and all men glad and wise. Age after age, their tragic 
Greek empires rise, built while they dream, and in that dreaming weep, would man but wake from out his haunted sleep, earth might be fair, and all men glad. So there's the drugged state that I was talking about earlier, the opiate of the masses. Would man but wake from out his haunted sleep, earth might be fair and all men glad and wise. There's a, a rage underlying this hymn and it comes out in the alliance between that hymn and that tune. I and my friends came across this hymn in songs of praise for schools at my rather prim girls grammar school. Feeling awfully daring, we chose it for an assembly taken by our form because we loved the words, we found them very powerful, but it was much frowned on by the headmistress who didn't think it at all appropriate uh, for public worship, at least in a girls' grammar school. The English hymnal tradition, also under Dierma's influence, mines a seam of American hymns whose language of human rights draws on the 18th and 19th century campaigns against the trade and exploitation of enslaved human beings. Among these are John White Chadwick's eternal ruler of the ceaseless round with its powerful we would be one in hatred of all wrong and abolitionist James Russell Lowell's startling once to every man and nation which we used to sing uh, when we chose it against the headmistress's wishes to the tune, the haunting brooding tune of um, Ebenezer. English hymnal and songs of praise also included a terrific hymn by the fiery radical poet Ebenezer Elliot. When wilt thou save the people? My slides of both these hymns uh, come in fact from the hymn book I grew up with, the fine 1951 publication, Congregational Praise, which contained rich and fascinating sections on social issues, much read by avid teenage worshippers in the 1960s, but almost never sung in church. So have a look at this second verse here. Feel the, the anger that's behind this. Shall crime be crime forever, strength aiding still the strong? Is it thy will, O Father, that man shall toil for wrong? No, say thy mountains, no thy skies. Man's clouded sun, clouded sun shall brightly rise, and songs ascend instead of sighs. God save the people. Rather weirdly, when uh, wilt thou save the people? and Turn Back, O Man, were taken up, both of them, in the 1970s rock musical Godspell. So instead of listening to one of the tunes that was written in the 19th century for When Wilt Thou Save the People, let's listen to a snatch from the Godspell version. I think they've caught it rather well with those big dramatic drum beats. Um, when will thou save the people? When will thou save the people? Uh, so it's a, a, a song, a hymn that has longevity, even though it's uh, almost never sung these days. It was first published in a Sheffield newspaper in 1832, and Ebenezer Elliot included it in his 1833 Corn Law Rhymes, a compilation of poems and songs campaigning against the inequalities of his own age. Bradley notes that it was sung widely, first at Chartist demonstrations and later in Labour churches. Jane Adams, founder of the social mission Hull House in Chicago, captures some of the atmosphere of such occasions on a visit to a similar enterprise in London's East End. When she writes, we heard Keir Hardy, Hardy one of the founders of the Labour movement, before a large audience of working men standing in the open square of Canning Town, outline the great things to be accomplished by the then new Labour Party 
and we joined the vast body of men in the booming hymn, When wilt thou save the people, O God of mercy, when? It must have been wonderful to be at some of these campaigning meetings, some of these rallies and mass assemblies, uh, to, to sing these vast, enormous campaigning hymns. It has its roots in a rich alternative tradition running through the 18th and 19th centuries. Alongside the swelling collections of Protestant hymnody of private devotion and public mission was as powerful a movement in social and campaigning songs. Because campaigning songs also drew on the same broadly Christian worldview, there was more continuity between the two than you might expect, and they are frequently full of rage. Many were collected in left-wing hymn and songbooks of the Chartist movement and labour movement, such as the 1849 Democratic Hymns and Songs. This includes texts from a pamphlet published four years earlier, the National Chartist Hymn Book, with 16 hymns unattributed, as hymns very often were at that time, but all except two authored by someone called John Henry Bramich, a Rochdale stockinger, that is, a Northern English factory worker, well acquainted with the harsh conditions he was campaigning to improve. One of his hymns, Assembled Neath Thy Broad Blue Sky, has been taken up by Garth Hewitt, socialist singer. I've given the full three-page sped here from the 1849 book so that you can follow Hewitt's compilation as he sings it and see how the texts developed. The original text is in three verses, starting with Assembled Neath Thy Broad Blue Sky, which you can see in the central column there. The text comprises, the three-verse text, comprises the first two and last verses of this version, which is uh, the extended version for the later collection. Garth Hewitt then goes back to the previous hymn in the first column, Britannia's Sons, Sons, and you'll be able to follow which verses he's singing before he goes back to the last verse of Assemble. So just follow those through as you hear the singing. But before we hear it, I'd like to draw your attention to the verse near the top of the third column, starting, all men are equal in his sight. Because I think this must be an echo, although it must be a common sentiment, of a hymn by Harriet Martineau, herself one of my heroes, Unitarian um, uh, social campaigner in her own time, um, which starts, all men are equal in his sight. And it uh, appears in this hymn book and in many other similar books. So we're going to hear now, um, uh, 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 I think, the whole of this Garth Hewitt uh, version of these two hymns. Assembled neath thy broad blue sky To thee, O God, thy children cry Thy needy creatures on thee call For thou art great and good to all Thy bounty smiles on every side And no good thing hast thou denied but man of wealth and man of power Like locusts all thy gifts devour No longer view yourselves as things Made for the use of useless kings Demand your rights, let tyrants see You are resolved that you'll be free Britain, your sons, though slaves ye be, God, your creator, made you free. He lived to all and being gay, but never, never made a slave. He 
made the sky with spangles bright, the moon to shine by silent night, the sun and spread the bars on the day, but never, never made a slave. All men are equal in his sight, the bond, the free, the black, the white. He made them all, them freedom gave. He made the man, man made the slave. No longer view yourselves as things made for the use of useless kings. Demand your rights, let tyrants see. You are resolved that you'll be free. You are resolved that you'll be free. You are resolved that you'll be free. If you're interested in following some of those things up, um, there's a compendious collection of campaign songs and hymns um, at uh, on this website that's showing here now, Our Subversive Voice, The History and Politics of the English Protest Song. So there's a vast well of excellent, profound, exciting hymnody that has simply sunk without trace. Hymns and songs were whipping up fervor in a range of causes at huge gatherings, such as Sunday school rallies, mission assemblies, women's suffrage or political campaign meetings. And they were collected first into small pamphlets of unattributed items, then made their way to larger collections, such as the immensely popular Sunday school hymnals, or as we've seen, political hymn books. Then there comes a parting of the ways. For a certain type of hymn, the Sunday school, mission hymns and so on, the next stage was absorption into books of 800 or so hymns with tunes. And then official denominational collections, which became the hymnody of the church. These large collections then provided the songs that traveled with the mission organizations out into the world. They were translated into hundreds of languages, utterly overriding the indigenous spirituality of the music into the places in which they went. All that richness was just uh, obliterated and carrying an imaginary based on Euro-American ways of thought, climate, the bleak midwinter, folk traditions, the holly and the ivy, and morality. And these are still being sung a hundred or a thousand years after they were written, while others have all but disappeared. But on their journey to take over the world, anything challenging or pretty well any hint of prophetic or messianic rage was quietly edited out, either by ignoring the huge and varied resources of texts of that nature, or by omitting or changing words. Bradley, again, those responsible for compiling the hymn books of the major churches were reluctant to include verses which questioned prevailing social or economic com conditions, or expressed a theology of liberation or radical change. I was part of the generation that grew up on that diet of hymns, which extolled the God of empire, whose reign was eternal and benign and extended all the way out to the ends of the earth and in to the human heart, submissive, meek, loathing its shortcomings in discipleship, pouring contempt on all its pride and above all hating the sins that made God mourn. There were hints at a stronger spirituality, hymns that lifted our eyes to God's presence in the real world that we actually lived in, hymns that were hidden in the recesses of our hymnals, but we never sang them. Until, that is, the folk revival, protest songs, Vatican II, the liberation movements of, the Latin, America, of Latin America, the civil rights movements, and for us in 1960s Britain, three unassuming books from a publisher whose books incidentally were banned in apartheid South Africa. Stainer and Bell Galliard, Burst on the Sea, Faith, Folk and Clarity, and later Faith, Folk and Nativity and Festivity, brought together a number of existing and new writers, including lots of songs by Sidney Carter, 
and then just one by a young woman, Susan Tucker, who now writes as singer-songwriter Sue Gilmurray, Estelle White, who became a prominent figure in the Roman Catholic celebration hymnal, which came out following uh, the Second Vatican Council, and others. They also drew widely on African-American spirituals and caught the start of liberation theology, though not much and not at all at the start of feminist theology uh, and feminist hymnody. Sidney Carter's Friday morning was a complete revolution to the generation that had brought, been brought up to be mild, obedient Christian children. Using the voice of the other criminal crucified with Jesus, the song expresses rage against the God who stays up in heaven with a million angels watching and doesn't do a thing while an innocent man is tortured to death. The punchline of each verse, it's God they ought to crucify instead of you and me, turns the tables on substitu substitutionary atonement theories. Here is N.T. Wright, Tom Wright, the New Testament theologian, singing it far too gently for my taste. A hanging on the tree To hell with Jehovah To the carpenter I said I wish that a carpenter Had made the world instead Goodbye and good luck to you Our ways they will divide Remember me in your kingdom The man you hung beside It's God they ought to crucify Instead of you and me I said to the carpenter A hanging on the tree It's not the way I sing it But uh, he got to hell with Jehovah Which is really, really startling To have that after a diet A, a, a young lifetime um, Of traditional hymnody Was absolutely amazing Better known by Sidney Carter is the hymn, When I Needed a Neighbour, Were You There? But he also wrote this version, calling out Christian involvement in fascism and racism. Look at these words. Goes to the tune of When I Needed a Neighbour. When they shouted, Hosanna, were you there, were you there? When they took me to prison, were you there? When the crosses were crooked, were you there, were you there? When the crosses were burning, were you there? When I needed a neighbour. Were you there? Were you there? And the creed and the colour and the name won't matter. Were you there? Judith Peep, I don't know how to pronounce her name, songwriter and activist in London's Soho, wrote, Come down, Lord, from your heaven, as a protest against the complacent, self-righteous hymnody of the Christian establishment. It, it, it mocks the complacency of the Christian church. Uh, and the tune uh, has a, an amazing um, octave leap, almost an octave leap, or an octave almost leap, uh, bet between the first two lines and the second two lines. And so it, it tells the story. They say you've gone to heaven, but I have heard them tell that before you went to heaven, Lord, you also went to hell. And then come down, Lord, up to that high E, which is high for folk singers. This is the, the folk um, uh, revival, remember. Come down, Lord, from your heaven. For if you went to hell, come down into the clip joint, Lord, come down to us as well. Come down, Lord, from your heaven. For if you love our kind, come down into the strip club, Lord, where only love is blind. And as I say, uh, the series brought not only well-known spirituals such as O oh Freedom, which we see here, I think, and there were many, many others, um, Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, um, uh, and uh, oh, the, the name of the, the one has uh, slipped my mind. I uh, had them all in front of me, and I, then I turned the page. Um, but there were they uh, in uh, faith, folk, and clarity. Um, uh, if you read through the index there and sing through the hymns, um, they drawn a lot on uh, African American spirituals. But also, um, uh, there's a powerful evocation of cruelty and torture through the vivid depiction of Jesus' death in Hammering, which we see next, which is cited from John Work's 1940 collection, uh, and where in which um, the, the powerful uh, 
the, it, it, the, the, the vivid um, uh, language about the, it, it, ostensibly about the cruelty of, of, of the crucifixion of Jesus, um, but it's also a work song. Um, and so it, 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 it's an evocation of uh, the, the, the bitter, harsh work that people were put to. Uh, and so, uh, uh, and it has the, 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 the question and answer, the, the, the top line and the bottom line answering each other. In his essay at the front of the 2001 GIA publication, Ameri African American Heritage Hymnal, the Reverend Otis Moss Jr. describes how the revival of spirituals in the 1950s and 60s took the songs and hymns of our ancestors into our marches, jail cells and mass meetings and fashioned the faith of a movement that reintroduced the African drum, chant and music in an undisguised and transforming symphony of protest and revolution. In words resonant of Audre Lorde, he writes, the walls of tyranny do not fall gently. There's a lot I haven't said. I've spent my life raging against patriarchy in words spoken, sung and written. And in a life of activism, it's been a lot of fun. I would argue that the same powerful force of prophetic wrath is just as necessary to shock us out of the soporific affection we have for hymns of empire and hammer away at generations of control of resources for worship by the colonial establishment and its all pervading legacy. The story of the following years in Britain, at least, mirrored the developments of hymnody in the 19th century. This is the years from the 1960s onwards. Those little short collections of hymns of protest and uh, social justice that proliferated in the 1960s came and they went. A survey of the hymn supplements that I've carried out uh, that carried new writing into the mainstream and provided a bridge from the 1960s songs into mainstream hymnody uh, show that only a few of those radical hymns made it through just as they did in the 19th century to the uh, late 19th century and 20th century hymnals. Even fewer reached the major denominational hymn books that followed from the 1980s onwards and drew from the supplements, a filtering uh, uh, process going on. I thank God for the scholarship and enterprise of organizations such as the Hymn Societies and the Centre for Congregational Songs, in particular this series, The World Sings. In the UK, I thank God for the Iona community and Wild Goose. In New Zealand, Alleluia, Aotearoa and others like them. And the rise of um, music, the Empire Strikes Back, the rise of music which we we dangerously call world music, that that suggests that there's music and world music. We need to find a nomenclature um, for these, um, the, the, the amazing movement to which we're, through, through which we're working and living now. But I fear always for the loss of that prophetic rage, uh, which has such a role in piercing the complacency that institutions use for the control of music, of Christian worship and music. And which is constantly around the edges, institutionalizing, trying to uh, constrain. Let me finish with a final example of what I mean, and then we'll get into some discussion, I hope. Here are two alternative versions of the hymn I started with, Jesus Christ is Waiting. This is the dancing verse, a lovely verse that should be sung lightly and rhythmically. And this is the version we normally sing. It ends, where good conquers evil. Let me dance with you. Nothing wrong with that, is there? But here is the original verse. And uh, it's very hard to find now. Nearly every hymn book which contains this doesn't have this verse. Chris, Jesus Christ is dancing, dancing in the streets, where each sign of... Now, I've, I've got my view over the top of it. Where each sign of hatred, he with love defeats, Listen, Lord Jesus, I should triumph too. On suspicion's graveyard, let me dance with you. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Um, I'm seeing some questions start to come in in the Q&A. 
Um, so I will, uh, I'll, I'll read these out loud as we go. Um, and if we run out of questions, I've got one or two for you as well. Um, thank you for such uh, an inspiring and rageful presentation. Um, Pat Mary Mayberry uh, asks, uh, loving this, uh, does the speaker offer any online courses on hymnody or other? <laughs> Not now. Uh, I, re I retired from active teaching, although I'd still do quite a bit, but uh, I only need inviting. <clears throat> That's that's great. Um, maybe <laughs> there will be an invitation in the future at some point. Oh, that's a dangerous thing to say, isn't it? Or an <laughs> arrogant thing. Maybe one or the other. Um, okay, Emily Brink, um, and and this is actually was on my mind. It has to do with mm. with the Psalms, um, and uh, she says, "Would you also argue that Psalm singers lost the Psalms of lament during the colonial period? The Psalms that remain today in hymnals are more often ones of praise." I think that's absolutely right. I, um, I've been doing some work on um, 17th century, the, the, the English Civil War, um, uh, and also uh, John Bunyan, because uh, that, that's the church I go to. Um, and they sang uh, the Psalms of lament and the Psalms of anger. Uh, they were very much part of their diet. Um, but in colonial times, I think that's right. and. Uh, they were too dangerous to include um and there's this filtering always what we need to watch out for this filtering process the whole time um because uh it, it's 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 working to strain out anything that has any um power to it of it not that there isn't power in praise um but it that's a power that that elevates and um unites uh I, I did run an interesting series of conferences um, based on Psalm 137. And we did an exercise in which we invited everybody sitting around in a circle. We were a European group um, and people were invited to read round the circle, Psalm 137, but not verse by verse, to sit and pray and, and then choose their verse from it. And then just read that verse. And a number of people read the bitter verses at the end, um, which we filter out in a, in a public act of worship. So I think there's, a, there's, there's a, a, a lot to be regained from the Psalms. The Niona community have done um, Psalms of praise and protest, I think it's called. It, it reminds me a bit of, you know, talk about this editing process in a, in a very quite literal way, the Bible was edited in slave Bibles, right? Like, like entire, chapters books were just wiped out um in order to control people because there were this, these dangerous parts of the bible that uh, the colonial powers didn't want to be uh, utilized as a weapon against them i've seen uh, i mean there was a soldier's bible in, in cromwell's time um but i've seen uh, um bibles that went out into the mission field the norwegian one um and it's very thin indeed yeah <laughs> indeed um I wanted to make sure you saw Nancy Graham in the chat said, thank you, Janet. FYI, Friday morning was banned from the hymnal put together for the U.S. military forces in the early 1970s. Uh -huh. Was it indeed? <laughs> I'll have that. Yeah. Um, okay. So um, Michael Hahn asked in the Q&A, um, thank you so much, Janet. As we sing our way through Advent and into Christmas and Epiphany, I'm struck that very few hymns address the slaughter of the innocents and the flight into Egypt during a time when children are dying of hunger and famine and the migration of peoples is increasing exponentially. We need to sing some hymns that cause us to say, ouch, even as we sing them. Yes, definitely. Um, that's a very interesting point. I mean, we the only one traditional hymn we've got is um, uh, unto us a uh, son is born isn't it that has herods and you have um in a wonderful piece of um typecasting the men singing uh, the verse about herod um but that isn't that's the retelling of the story it's not a it doesn't engage with it in any way but hymns that engaged with the um the plight of refugees the injustice the the, the scandal of refugees um and 
the particularly the scandal of, of unhomed children. And there's such there's a powerful, powerful resource there. It'd be very interesting to see that that yes, Coventry Carol, yes, uh, engages with it. But again, they don't engage in the sense of bringing it into conversation mm. with with the horrors of our own time. Mm. Uh, Lynn in the chat says, "What do you suggest we do about the text? Thou didst not abhor the virgin's womb, benign words filled with misogyny." Mm. Um, among many benign words filled with misogyny. Um, this Good has book been my title. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I, I don't know. The, the, this has been a life's work, and it is a life's work. Um, it's a life's work too. This is where the rage is needed because we we grow up with these words. They pass us by. They go through our brain without leaving a. a they, well, by shaping our brains into misogynistic patterns without in re even realizing. Um, and the, some of them are easy to get rid of without people, almost without people realizing. Um, but the rage helps us to tackle e even uh, ones that people are used to and love. I, one thing is to write lots and lots of new material. Um, but particularly at Christmas time, uh, these are hymns that are uh, sung and loved. They're in people's minds as they go shopping and do all these things. Um, I, I hope that in feminist hymnody, but also in decolonializing de hymns, that a real radical task is in front of us. I'm sorry I'm so old, because I would like I... to <laughs> see the beginning of it, get it all the way through. <laughs> I'm I'm reminded of the the Shirley Murray text um, that was set by Ito Lo, um, mm. uh, and that there's a line that uh, Jesus is crucified again on a Christmas tree. Um, mm. I can't remember the name of the text now, but I'm sure someone in the chat will. Um, Michael Hans the one that introduced me to it, so he would he would know. Shirley Murray's um, text uh, uh, meet these things face on. They do uh, Hunger Carol. Uh, Thank you, Michael. Yeah. Oh right. I, I, I had a load of those at the end of this, um, but, but we would have been here for an hour and a half. Yeah, yeah I exactly. Loved every minute of it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, did, I, I had the privilege of interviewing Shirley Murray uh, um, for uh, one of my books. Uh, that was absolutely fabulous. Wonderful. Um, John Thornburg uh, asks in the Q&A, isn't it possible that if a congregation is being routinely called into engagement in the injustices of the world, whether through preaching or outreach ministries, that someone could hear Watts' phrase, poor contempt on all my pride, not as turning the worshiper inward in self-loathing, but rather encouraging the worshiper to exit the pride of feeling him herself as privileged, entitled, or superior. I ask this because that's what Watts' words awakened in me. That's brilliant. That's fabulous. Um, and I hadn't, I've taken the, I've only t taken part of the journey then because I've gone away. F I've, I've moved away from my childhood faith where I thought I had to get rid of pride, um, mm. particularly little girls were taught to get rid of pride uh, again and again. Um, but uh, I hadn't taken the next steps with this one then of, of turning it round. I wonder how the, it could, it would have to be done carefully, wouldn't it? I mean, mm. there, there would have to be some engagement with the congregation i would i knew i'm going to try this and if you try it too um can we share how it goes how it works maybe you've already done this john well it it, it reminds me of the importance of context um mm. i was just reading something where it was it was just like context is everything and um hymns rarely live in in isolation they are their liturgical things that that only happen when we make music with them, um, and that's always in the context of something else, right? Other words being spoken, things being done. Um, I'm reminded of a performance practice that is uh, uh, at the chapel services at a Methodist a music and worship Methodist retreat center in North Carolina. Um, they sing. Uh, the uh, uh, the Magnificat setting by Rory Cooney, 
canticle of the turning and the, in the last line uh the spear and ro- rod will be crushed by god they yell that line the spear and rod will be crushed by god and they like they pound their fists and they yell they yell the line in this rageful way um so even though that that's god acting it's like they're, they're enacting the rage in their performing pre- performance practice that's really that's powerful the the nearest thing i've i've come to that is 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 actually shouting that jesus christ is raging verse but also hmm. um banning or speaking about every time the the the, the choruses that take be still and know that i am god as a sort of gentle be still and, and god is here and isn't it lovely and everything where it's actually <laughs> it's um <laughs> stop fighting <laughs> um uh, so we we do we yell that sometimes be still <laughs> uh, quiet you know the loudest word in the, the in a competition the loudest word spoken in the english language by a, a northern irish woman teacher was quiet quiet <laughs> <laughs> yeah context is everything right <laughs> um some someone in the chat the one of the hymn society staff members it looks like uh i think that the first person singular in Watts text lends itself mm. to an individualistic interpretation and a tendency to turn inward. We need texts that push us outward. Would it be possible to sing the Watts text in the first person plural? I don't know. That would have to be thought about. Hmm. But, but certainly um, the use of the first person singular, uh, that's something I do with them. Um, uh, hymn books that come from a more evangelical um, stable is, I call it an I test. I go through the index and see how many hymns start I, the, mm. the first person singular. And, and it proliferates where, where we're be, being called into that close individual relationship with God. Yeah. Um, one, one of the other, uh, the, the question that I have for you, uh, we're done with the Q&A uh, uh, so far. Um, nothing else has popped in, but w- one of the things I have a question about is um, the, the the and actually I think this just came up in the chat the the tunes and the musical mm. styles that are currently being used in church music I, I think don't lend themselves well to rage, mm. um, but where I see it happening as far as like current genres and stuff um, are in hip like hip hop. Um, the 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 origins of of rap and R and B and and hip hop come from this this you know the ghettos um, mm. of of America and and this this rage against the machine um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and and so when that genre is matched with hymn text within within the context of Christian worship I think there's a lot of interesting possibilities there to embrace rage from a, a tune musical mm. style mm. side of things rather than just the text. I don't know. And I'm, I'm wondering if there are other examples you have of, of how the musical settings can encourage us to, to embrace this idea. Certainly the, um, the musical settings of the protest songs in the 19th century are full of rage themselves. There's um, the the March of the Women, uh, the Women's Suffrage, uh, the the song with the uh, female composer and writer, and then women singing it, um, is is a very powerful uh, marching song. Um, and I wonder if maybe uh, the reason I I use the nineteenth um, century material is partly to show the imbalance of what's come through, but partly also that there's a great source to be mined there, not that we should be singing 19th century stuff, more 19th century stuff, but the the strength of the stuff that comes from there. Um, Maybe replacing some of the 19th century stuff. Yeah, yes, <laughs> with something as powerful about our own time, like um, the the uh, the slaughter of the innocents in, in, in the light of uh, what happens to so many people now. Hmm. Um, and daring to do that. There is, there is material like that, um, uh, Elizabeth Cosnitz, for God's sake, let us dare to pray like Josephine. Mm. Um, uh, and, and 
there's other material like that. And that's got a, that's got a tune by Ian Sharp, I think, um, which is quite bare and, and not sweet at all. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's a challenge. I'm not a composer, uh, or a musician. Um, so well, I think, there's I think a challenge one, one of the other, um, like I'm thinking of, of how musically, how rage can come through. And I think there's a, there's an interesting problem musically of accidentally getting into militaristic sounds. Yes. You know, yes. The snare drum and stuff, which, which may yes. not quite be the right direction, right? You don't, mm. um, how do we rage without getting into the, the, uh, Matthew using the sword? Yes. Right. Where, where Jesus is like, no, no, that's not that the right kind of rage here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. And so you look at Jesus raging then perhaps and, and see what, um, how you would express that. I think that Ju Judith Peep, how, how do you say her name? Um, song does that a bit with that great high that uh, so come down lord from your heaven it's where rage meets longing i think um mm. where there's not it's not rage as i will beat you but rage is that, that surely this can happen um that's another good book title by the way oh yeah where rage oh. meets longing oh there you go <laughs> <laughs> or a good uh, first first line of a text yes 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 <laughs> yeah yes yeah, so we'd have to scan in a longer line wouldn't it yeah. Well, Janet, um, thank you so much. Um, uh, just just from reading the chats and and all of the questions that have come through, I think you've you've really um, helped push us in a in a prophetic direction. Um, and thank you for this life's work that you've uh, worked on and continue to work on. And I just every time we talk um, and every every time I've encountered you, I've been um, provoked into into something new. And so I uh, thank you very much for gifting that to us through this webinar. And uh, it'll, it'll be archived online for anyone that missed it or wants to watch it again or reference anything that uh, Janet has said. Um, it'll probably be ready in about two or three days and we'll send out an email to all the registrants with that information. Um, Janet, is there anything you wanna leave us with before we call it a day? Well, thank you for having me. It's been great. And uh, and find the rage and the longing uh, and then put it out into hymns. Be great. Thank you. All right, everyone. Take care.